three more minutes, but you have them and responding. Okay, thank you. Hello, sorry. Um, the next presenter is Agatha Piekowski, who will have pictures and a presentation on the Albanian experience in terms of legal frames of memory. It's just one picture. <laughs> just one, okay. Just one, but it's a good one. I hope. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me, I'm suffering from a bad cold, so um, I might have to pause here and there. Um, this paper considers a specific legal frame of memory from the early years of the Albanian dictatorship. The frame is filled by a photograph of Musina Kokolare from her 1946 trial. I analyzed this Albanian political dissident's image with a view to identifying key historical, legal, and political narratives that underpin contemporary efforts made by Albanian authorities to address the crimes of the Enver Hoxha dictatorship in the period that we're dealing with here is 1945 to 1991. So I need to unlock my image here. And uh, scholarship has been done on the aesthetic dimension of the law that is engaged by an image. Um, the language of the law in this scholarship uh, is depicted as a language of record. And in this constellation, the law needs to understand itself as a language and imagery of transmission, of the transmission of a mode of institutional life and all that institution implies. So for Peter Goodrich, we should fight against our urge to resist pictures and indeed the memory that is attached. So pictures are an important medium and they can also be found at the heart of a mnemonical community. Now, mnemonical communities are bound to specific events and interpretations of these occurrences. These can vary. And um, it can make a memory fixed, or it can uh, be a catalyst for a memory event. According to Pier Nora, there are sites of memory that are defined spatially as stop time. And there are other sites of memory that are better described as memory events defined spatially as start time by endowing the past with a new life for the future. Now this is a work in progress and I'm arguing here that this image is a key part of the historical and political discourse about the Albanian communist terror. And I'm hoping to show that it has an important place in transitional justice initi initiatives and going in some way to explaining the unfinished nature of specific legal narratives. But first, who are we dealing with? Who was Musin Kokolare? Musin was born in 1917 um, into a family of intellectuals who were active in politics and literature. Musin herself finished a degree in literature in Italy. Um, <clears throat> By 1941, she had written three books. Um, she was very much interested in Albanian folklore, dealing with her roots in southern Albania, coming from Giocastra. Um, I should point out, she was very active in anti-fascist and anti-nationalist movements. Um, her fate rested with, excuse me, let me start that again. The fate of her brothers, rather, led her to put aside her first love, that being literature, for politics. Um, so she became engaged with political, uh, establishing a political party with um, a vision of a post-war Albania. Her legacy uh, is the stoicism that she um, showed at her trial and in particular, her replies to court interrogation. Now, in terms of these trials, um, there are six key ones over the period of 1945 to 1951 that successfully consolidated the dictatorship and its power over the populace. The second trial, referred to as the Albanian op uh, opposition trial, was the first concerning political dissidents. Musin was one of 37 defendants. Charges here were brought under a 1944 law concerning special military courts. 
to hear crimes of war criminals and traitors. Uh, the trial proceedings were held in the National Cinema in Tirana with a selected audience and media. And it's transmitted throughout the city. If I just go back to her image here, um, we could also place that into, and I realize I'm risky here in terms of, I'm trying to abstain from making any special descriptors in terms of the image, but it is a powerful one, and in particular placed within the context of the vehemence that was meted out by the court towards Musin during this trial. And it is the fate of Musina and her peers that has prompted survivors and scholars to describe this period as the genocide of the Albanian intellectual. Now, if we can turn to for one moment um, with respect to the trial transcript. These are narratives coming from this 1946 trial transcript. And they can be a particular kind of memorial device that offers itself up for interpretation. And while it may freeze the record, the transcript cannot govern its own interpretation. So the transcript provides insight into the nature of the proceedings. But more importantly, it invites readings of silences and exclusions. And this is quite important when we think about the past which particular past counts and matters, in particular through the eyes of a successor regime. Albania's political culture is underdeveloped. You're looking here at, from 1944 onwards, the Communist Party being very successful in preventing opposition from both within its own ranks and outside. Um, the instrument of power was its vast police network, which dominated all aspects of life. Um, Sigurimi, regular and brutal purges, very um, much controlling um, contact with the outside world. I don't want to present this as a sort of cause and effect kind of argument here, but more to understand the challenge or the puzzle that is placed before uh, a country that um, presents a peculiar example of a European dictatorship and totalitarian rule. It's, this chapter has prompted uh, writers in exile, commentators, to say that perhaps the country could pardon communism for many crimes, but not, not that of having deprived it of its most valuable capital. With respect to Albanian transitional justice, the country did successfully prosecute its communist elite in the early 1990s not, um, for, for committing economic crimes, embezzlement, which in uh, the eyes of some trivialized the serious human rights transgressions of the regime. With the input of whatever there was left there in terms of a civil society, the bare remnants, there was a move to push for a 1995 law, genocide law, which was aimed to assist and accelerate the prosecution of perpetrators of these crimes under the auspices of the communist regime. Um, yet these prosecutions could have taken place under the Albanian criminal code. Article 73 does set out genocide. Um, and um, there were very few criminal prosecutions that resulted following this law. Genocide would later be picked up by survivors and scholars um, writing on this area, but it became politicized and um, taken over by more administrative measures in the form of illustration. Albanian transitional justice and its timeline, we could say perhaps starting with 1985, sorry that's a typo in my paper, 1985 with Hoxha's death, is arguably anachronic. And based on my field work in 2012 and 2013, I kept being confronted by this image. Um, and that featured quite prominently in three occurrences or initiatives, if you like. The first refers to the publications of the Institute for the Studies of Communist Crimes, an institute created in 2010 by Parliament, which carries out research in this area and has a possibility for criminal prosecutions, but this is a little bit vague, and it's even more vague now with the uh, new Rama government in terms of its future. 
The second relates to the release of a documentary entitled The Martyrs, directed by Sarmir Kumbaro and shown as part of a human rights festival. And the third concerns the exhibit at Tirana's National History Museum on the genocide of the Albanian intellectual and its subsequent publication of a catalog, The Communist Terror in Albania. These occurrences, events seem to take the form of storytelling, storytelling in a transitional justice context and form. And within that storytelling, you have information about the victims and you have information about the perpetrators. And you have then little initiatives or moves that are sparked, for example, on the part of the director of the institute to write in the national newspaper criticizing the lack of p political will to criminally prosecute um, the perpetrators of these judicial crimes, many of whom have gone on to pursue secondary careers in education and several of whom have been confronted by their victims on the streets of Tirana. Parts of the past exist, but the approach is far from efforts where storytelling has been recognized as reaffirming some sort of commitment, whether it is to law or finding some sort of coherence in terms of managing memories. So the storytelling is uncoordinated, like the law, but there is a historical discourse about the communist terror that has emerged. So what's in a face? Mark Oshell argues that storytelling is, driven, is led by society, driven by historical tropes, tragedy, triumph, resistance to subordination, subordination irony. Um, and criminal law's trope is vindication of society's basic norms protecting the individual's liberties against whoever denies them. And both of these tap into the main storylines and can shape justice. What Moussin's image seems to show is a master narrative here that's being constructed, uh, also with the help, using the help, the momentum of the mnemonical communities here that are revisiting the genocide of the intellectual. Um, Moussin's image also provides clues about the transitional process and some surprises too by taking a wider, broader look at Moussin and what we know about Moussin, we see the significance of political dissidents, something that can fill a gap in legitimizing the law. Moussin's image also uh, asks what are societal expectations when a part of its past is described as genocide? And Moussin's image also um, draws our attention to those silences in the readings, not forgetting those silences in the readings of parts of those past that haven't been counted. Thank you. Our third presenter is arriving. And since both of you have been so extremely disciplined and talked very briefly, we have this. Believe me, it wasn't easy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I really, really appreciate it. I skip the paragraph. Of course. It would be awkward for you to, know, to read the paragraph that we've just missed. So we're waiting for, for the third presenter. We have this oh, moment. He's, he's arriving, so if you want to stretch your arms, this would be a good moment to do. Sure, one. Oh, wow. That's already five questions. <laughs> I, would, I would just win. And then. So I, I'll be very brief, uh, even though I have three questions for, um, for Rivka Brod. C can you give us a very brief sense of the number of cases processed by the courts you talked about? Um, number two. Uh, can you give us a brief sense of the nature of the proceedings, the due process that was involved, who were the actors, the judge, a prosecutor, a defense attorney? And number three, the outcome was often exclusion. You said exclusion, and I would like to know more what exclusion meant within the DP camp setting and then later in life after the camps. Thank you. 
Yeah, no, not exactly. But, uh, so I, I okay, okay. Thank you for for your question. Uh, first of all, the number of proceedings. There are only. Uh, I, I I don't really know. Uh, um, the the head of the joint in the American uh, uh, occupation occupation zone in Germany wrote in his book that there was about almost 400 proceedings, but I. I'm taking it as a number. I don't. I'm, I, I don't really know. Um, all the the legal actors were uh, uh, Holocaust survivors and were uh, 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 residents in, in the DPs. The judges. There were also uh, always three judges <coughs> at the panel. One of the, one of them had to be uh, uh, from the legal uh, profession. And the other were just regular uh, 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 DPs. Um, there was a, a, a public defender. She was a woman. I think she was the only woman uh, in a public, uh, in a public uh, office. Uh, or, uh, the only one that I, know, uh, that I know of. And there was a public, uh, um, a, um, a public prosecution. Uh, uh, and um, and the audience were a very uh, important part of the of the uh, of, of the proceedings, and the most important question is about the the outcome of the of the exclusion. It was a symbolic exclusion. No one could uh, uh, make a, a DP uh, getting out, uh, throwing him out of the uh, of the camp because. Uh, they were all subject to the military uh, to the military rules, so they couldn't do it. But it was kind of a, of a, a, a symbolic exclusions. They were uh, they were. Um, I haven't I, I I haven't found any trace of or, or uh, any traces of literally uh, uh, making someone getting out of the camps. So I, I think it's kind of a, of, of a sign, you know, I was, I was declared as a traitor to the Jewish people. So it's all, uh, it, it was all about uh, symbolic actions. Thank you. Thank you. The other questions will be when they usually are, which is after the commentator. So um, I would say it's, it's a good way of filling 